Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is chapter 2, part 7 and 8, and this is the last bit. The Total Man Man originates as a humble fragment of nature, the feeblest and nakedest of all biological beings. But this feeblest of beings boldly joins battle. He becomes an essence separated from natural existence at once vulnerable but powerful. This separation is fundamental. Man no longer is or can be nature, yet he is only in and by virtue of nature. This contradiction is reproduced and grows more profound during the actual process which must lead to man overcoming it. Man is creative activity. He produces himself through his activity. He produces himself, yet he is not what he produces. Bit by bit, his activity brings nature under control, but only for his mastery to turn against him, to take on the characteristics of an external nature and involve him in the social determinism which inflicts terrible suffering on him. Man is not this determinism, and yet without it, he is nothing. In the first place, the human exists exists only in and by virtue of the inhuman. Not only does man depend on nature, but he is the feeblest element even of society. Man opposes the biological brutality to which he is subject no less brutally in law, morality, and religion. Man is thus profoundly divided, but it is only by virtue of this division that he can form himself. To start with, it is only a contradiction between himself and nature. Within this contradiction, the two terms act on one another reciprocally, and the, char uh, the characteristics of one pass over into the other. After every resolution, the contradiction reappears in a form all the more profound and dramatic because the unity that had been attained was a higher and more conscious one. Hitherto, those activities which actually overcome the natural forms of antagonism, the praxis, thought, mind, which involves a certain imminent unity and dominates the external world, have served only to worsen man's divisions and conflicts and make him feel them more keenly. It still seems that the human does not exist, that it is only an illusion or a cons consolation. Yet man is already in existence. He is made manifest to us as soon as we take into account human activity as a whole and stop seeing each object, event, and individual in accordance with their ephem ephemeral particularities. In the first place, man's essence is an abstract possibility, an eternal split or separation. It seems as, as if this essence has as yet only an ideal, metaphysical existence. But each problem posed by contradiction calls for its solution, moves towards that solution, determines an activity that will transcend it, and thus posits a fresh degree of actuality for the human essence. Each time a contradiction is resolved, living man draws closer to that essence. It is as if the latter were the imminent driving force of history and of the dramatic movement of human affairs. Discovery and creation converge. The human is at once created, produced, and discovered. Idealism isolates that part of man which emerges gradually, considering it in itself, independent of the conditions of its, of its existence, as if it had succeeded in advance. For all eternity. In this way, idealism makes the birth of man seem without drama. Man is born and realizes himself in that which is other, in relation to himself, in that which denies him and which he denies, and yet which is intimately joined to him, nature. He is merged with nature, yet gradually acquires authority over it, creating for himself a human nature. As commonly used, this term has become deceptively familiar and its true meaning has been concealed. Nature becomes human, Around and within man, it becomes a world, an organized experience. 
a man becomes nature, a concrete existence, a power. Human labor humanizes man's natural environment, and nature is internalized by man and becomes a rational life force, an instinctive energy freed from the limitations of nature and passive instinct. Human nature is a unity, an exchange of being, a transcending of the separation. Labor, economic production, is not an end in itself. The essential outcome of production is the existence of man. Nature is the inorganic body of man. Man lives off nature, which means to say, nature is his body, with which he must remain linked by a constant process in order not to die. That man's physical and spiritual life should be in touch with nature merely means that, that nature is in touch with itself, for man is part of nature. But it is in the elaboration of the world of objects that man affirms himself as a specific being. This production is the active life of his species, thanks to which nature appears as his handiwork and his reality. The object of labor is therefore objectification and the specific life of man. Insofar as he duplicates himself, not intellectually as in consciousness, but really in action and contemplates himself in a world created by him. Social history is the history of man's appropriation of nature and of his own nature. Social labor and economic activity are the means of this appropriation, essential moments of the human essence. Once they have been brought under control and integrated by this essence. In themselves, they are not this essence. Economic man has got to be transcended so that the freedom of the total man can be made manifest. Man appropriates to himself his multiple essence inasmuch as he is total man. The total movement is broken up by action and by thought. This separation cannot be absolute, but it does have a relative reality grounded on man's struggle against nature. Physical determinism depends on man acting in and on nature. Social determinism extends nature into man. Human nature resolves these conflicts, deploys a higher unity, and transcends the determinisms by organizing them. Just like nature seen in its totality, human nature is spontaneity, but an organized and rational one. The total man is all nature. Within him, he contains all the energies of matter and of life, and the whole past and future of the world. But he transforms nature into will and freedom. Products and the forces of production are the other of this total man, in which he may be destroyed. The independence of economic forces, the destiny of modern man, must be understood and brought under control. As soon as the objectivity of the social process is defined as such, it is already on the way to being transcended. It is united with the activity of the active and already objective human subject and supplies him with a new objective content. It is subjectified in him, but only so that a more objective human activity can arise, which can take itself more effectively as the object of an action produce itself more rationally and be its own conscious creation. The various forms of destiny have always been this other of man. History has been irreparably bloody and tragic too insofar as no destiny can be justified in respect of those who endure it, but only by the human future which all forms of destiny at once prepare for and paralyze. Yet history has not been a meaning, meaningless chaos of anecdotes and acts of violence. Such a view of history denies history, which can exist as such only by virtue of its living subject, the total man who forms himself through history. Man has not yet been born. He is still in the throes of childbirth. As unity and resolution, he is hardly, hardly even a presentiment. As yet, he is only in and through his opposite, the inhuman within him. As yet, he is dispersed throughout the multiple activities and specialized forms of production into which reality and the newborn consciousness of human nature are broken up. As yet, he is conscious of himself only in what is other than himself, in ideologies. 
Once the creative activity has become diversified, social man continues to discover himself and the result of his action. But the products invested with consciousness cease to be immediate, as they are for primitive man or for children. They become social and abstract, a new sort of product appears, spiritual products, and henceforward there are three degrees of external yet essential production. Material products, social objects properly so called, and spiritual products. From one point of view, these last are objects. They are external to the consciousness of human individuals. In another sense, they depend strictly on the activity in a given social framework at a particular moment of history. These ideologies express both the global activity of social groups, the level attained by their practical power, and the breaking up of the world and of consciousness into fragmentary activities. They disguise the true relations. The activity that seeks to become conscious of itself in them is uprooted from itself and, so to speak, carried out of himself. Ideological representations transpose the human onto the plane of things, of external substances, gods, destinies, absolute metaphysical truth, these spiritual things are superimposed on material things with which they have no conscious relationship until men are made to lose all awareness of their own creative activity. The objectivity of spiritual products contains an element of illusion, but this appearance is turned into a reality. Men believe that their social representations have a transcendent origin and organize themselves accordingly as this belief is taken over and exploited politically. Theoretical alienation thus becomes practical alienation by reacting on the praxis. Myths and fetishes seem to be endowed with a real power, the power that men have in fact conferred on them and which is nothing but their own power being turned against them. In another sense, these products contain a truth. They express concrete human life by transposing it. They become the elements of ways of life or cultures which have always had a partial validity and certainty and sorry and certain of which especially greek life and culture can perhaps be integrated into the modern world once this has been organized and renewed in general such ways of life resulted from the repetition and accumulation of the humblest actions of practical life History displays, however, in most great civilizations, a distressing contradiction between the magnificence of ideological justifications, costumes and words, and the monotony of everyday gestures. Only the future will be able to resolve this form of contradiction between consciousness and reality. Ideologies are effective essentially because people believe in them, but bit by bit consciousness withdraws from such products and reconquers itself through reflection and through the development of a real dominion over the world. All ideologies have been transcended in history after a greater or lesser period of unhappy consciousness. Thought and the human reality are formed through ideologies, but only by transcending them and freeing themselves from them. so that they can finally posit themselves as real activities. Even today, at a time when his dominion over nature is already great, living man is more than ever the victim of the fetishes he himself has raised up. Those strange existences, both abstract and real, brutally material yet clad in ideologies that are alluring and sometimes even bewitching. A new consciousness is, ne is needed, tenacious, rational, and skeptical, in order that these fetishes should be unmasked, and in order that the reason should not be swept away out of control. Dialectical materialism seeks to be the expression and the organ of this consciousness. Living men still do not fully understand their essence and their true greatness. The analysis of the production of man by himself shows that all the philosophical definitions of man's essence correspond to moments of that production. The term production is essential because it contains the other terms and explains them, because it contains and presupposes in man nature, action, and knowledge. 
It is a word frequently understood very trivi trivially because it is used in its most limited sense, but it signifies the whole greatness of man. Its truth is not yet self-evident because even today human life is not produced consciously and does not comprehend its own production. It moves within fetishism as a mode of existence and of consciousness. The object produced by labor is supposed is opposed to man as an alien being, as an independent power. Just as in religion, the spontaneous activity of the fancy, of the brain and the human heart acts on the individual in a way that is independent of him, as an alien activity, either divine or diabolical. So the activity of the producer is not his own spontaneous activity. His vital activity, the productive life of man, appears to him only as a means in order to satisfy a need. The physical need to survive, life itself appears only as a means. All production is an appropriation of nature by the individual within and by means of a social form. To say that today man's essence is still alienated means above all that the forms of our society do not permit this appropriation of nature by the individual. What ought, in ethical terms, to be an end in itself is still only a means. Man's creative activity, his essence, his individuality. The present situation is intolerable because the human reality is more profoundly dissociated than ever. Today it seems as if all the possible varieties of division, dispersion, and contradiction have come together, have converged to cause man untold suffering. The reality of the human is imperiled. It is growing blurred in our minds and it is threatened in its concrete existence. A time has come when everything that men had looked on as inalienable has become an object of exchange or of barter and can be alienated. Virtue and conscience, love and knowledge, which had hitherto been passed on generous, generously as a gift, are now commercialized. This is the age of general corruption, of universal venality. The need for money is the one true need engendered by political economy, with the result that the quantity of money is becoming more and more the one essential quality of man. This alienation gives rise sometimes within, in the, within the self-same individuals, both to refined and artificial forms of greed and to a bestial simplification of their needs. Man sinks lower than the animals. He enters into solitude. He, somet he sometimes goes so far as to lose even the desire for true commerce with his fellows. The whole of life is, for him, an alien power which he feels slipping through his fingers. The social essence is inhuman. It is quite simply money. It is thus precisely an economic essence. My means of subsistence are those of someone else. Whatever is the object of my desire is the inaccessible possession of someone else. Everything is other than itself. Even my activity is other. In the end, and this is also true for the capitalist, an inhuman power reigns over the whole. The inhuman is precisely this predominance of the economic, the essence of man has been handed over to a thing, to money, to the fetish. It is fairly symptomatic of the present reversal of values that Marx should have been accused of an absolute economicism. economicism. Yeah, whatever. Whereas the essential aim of his philosophy is to transcend economic man. As an individual, the capitalist is a man deprived of everything except money. But the non-capitalist experiences a more brutal privation, his social content and vital substance being external in relation to the individual. He lacks money, which is the sole meaning of a social life based on profit. The human man is unthinkable outside a community. All social structures have defined a certain unity. However, whenever a community is rent by internal conflicts, whether latent or ostensible, it ceases to be a true community. Man reverts to being an animal for man and the human is then alienated as well as the human community. The present multiform alienation of man 
and of the community is grounded in the inhuman situation of certain social groups, the most important of which is the modern proletariat. This social group is excluded from the community, or else admitted to it only in appearance, verbally, so that it can be exploited politically. Neither in its material nor its spiritual condition does it share in the community, and whenever it takes action in order to do so, its enemies say that it is destroying the community. In a social structure based on the private ownership of the principal means of production, the proletariat is merely one instrument amongst many, an appendage of the machine. The modern worker has to sell his labor power. He becomes a commodity, a thing amongst other things. Labor is an external power. It is exercised over the individual as over a thing. The more the worker produces by his labor, Marx had already written in 1844, the more powerful the alien world of objects he creates opposite him becomes. And the more impoverished his inner world, his labor is external to the laborer. He does not affirm himself in his labor, but denies himself and feels unhappy. He feels himself only outside of his labor. His labor, therefore, is not the satisfaction of a need, but only a means of satisfying needs independent of him. The activity of the laborer, therefore, is not his auto activity. It belongs to another. It is the loss of himself. As a result, the man who works no longer feels free except in his animal functions, eating, drinking, breeding. In his human functions, he no longer feels himself to be anything but an animal. True eating, drinking, and breeding are also authentically human functions. But in the abstraction that separates them from the other spheres of activity and turns them into an end, they become animal. This relation is that of the laborer and of his own activity inasmuch as it is alien to him. The producers are thus, both as individuals and as group, separated from and deprived of the goods they have created. The producers as a whole do not receive the material products as a whole in order to consume them. The economic consequence of this is the relative surplus production which turns the abundance that is today a possibility into a privation into a crisis, into political and economic conflicts. The life of the human community is broken up. Creative activity becomes a means for the individual who is thus separated from the community. In particular, the community is only a means for the individuals possessing the means of production. In this way, alienation extends over the whole of life and the individual cannot escape from it. Whenever he tries to free himself, he isolates himself in himself which is nothing more nor less than an acute form of alienation. The human essence results from the totality of the social process. The individual can attain it only if he has a rational and inherent, or sorry, and coherent relationship with the community. He must neither separate himself from the community nor lose himself in it. However, in our own society, in which relations appear to have been inverted, the individual may believe that he is realizing himself by isolating himself, in which case he is more profoundly deprived still and cut off from his base, from his social roots. He can grasp himself only as a theoretical abstraction, as soul, inner life, ideal, or as a biological being, body, sexual desire. He fosters and reproduces within himself, in a more severe form, the dissociation of the community. The contradiction within him is multiform. Between the unconscious and conscious and consciousness, between the, between the natural and the human, between the social and the individual, between instinct and rationality, between content and form, between practice and theory. The proletariat is the concrete element of this society, its practical aspect. Through its labor, it is in constant contact with the materiality and resistance of things, with the contradiction of given existence. Dialectical materialism has taken shape as an expression of the proletariat, 
although it transcends the limitations of the proletarian condition precisely by becoming aware of them. In the name of philosophical culture, of economic science, and of all the hopes of social reformers, the proletariat therefore possesses certain essential elements of the human. On the other hand, the bourgeoisie possesses certain other equally essential elements, rationality and culture. These last, simply because they have become separated from the first, have become abstract and formal. The community of man has been replaced by the more or less concealed exercise of violence over an essential part of man, by the infinite dispersion into individualism and the rivalry of competing individuals. This dispersion has manifested its manifested itself even within individual individuality itself the concrete practical or natural element has become separated from the rational or, or cultural one rationality brings the concrete content under control by violence the spiritual powers deprived of a content function abstractly the cultured individual has become the theoretical man described by nietzsche the material and spiritual dissociation of our society can only get worse. It has entered necessarily into its decline, as is confirmed by the specifically economic analysis. To put an end to this situation, we have got to transcend the social structure, which subordinates one class to another and subjects one profound element of the human reality to another, because these human elements are wielded by conflicting groups We've got to overcome an economic organization in which the proletariat is only an instrument of production and in which correspondingly the reality of production is underestimated. In particular, in order to resolve the opposition between the individual and the social, in order to discover the connection and unity between the elements of the content, we've got to become fully conscious of the praxis. Since the limitations of our consciousness are themselves grounded in a certain praxis, that of our own economic and social structure, this must be overcome so that we can create a new praxis, a coherent, planned one. We may in fact be close to achieving the human essence. In this extreme dispersion and contradiction in our material and our spiritual plight, this essence will attain a richer unity for having been alienated in such a multiplicity. So profound are the contradictions that they make a unity imperative. In this way, in materialist humanism, the notions of the idealist become more precise. The en soi and the pour soi, the seed and the fulfillment, alienation and the transcending, object and subject, essence and existence. By starting from an analysis of the praxis, it is possible to show how the moments of the activity come into being, as well as the categories of thought and of action, and the different spheres of knowledge. The dialectical notion of alienation dominates and epitomizes this description of man in his becoming. It takes account both of the present drama and the historical drama of the human. It provides the final significance of the praxis. Conversely, the analysis of the praxis confers a positive character on this notion. The total man is both the subject and object of the becoming. He is the living subject who is opposed to the object and surmounts this opposition. He is the subject who is broken up into partial activity activities and scattered determinations and who surmounts this dispersion. He is the subject of action as well as its final object, its product even its product even if it does seem it does seem to produce external objects. The total man is the living subject object who is first of all torn asunder, dissociated and chained to necessity and abstraction. Through this tearing apart, he moves towards freedom. He becomes nature, but free. He becomes a totality, like nature, but by bringing it under control. The total man is de-alienated man. A practical and materialist philosophy cannot allow itself to offer a transcendent ideal. Its ideal must be a function of reality. 
must have its roots in this reality and exist there already as a potentiality. The ideal of the total man satisfies this requirement. Moreover, the reality of what is humanly possible can be determined scientifically by specifically economic or sociological investigation. Human alienation will end with the return of man to himself, that is to say in the unity of all the elements of the human. This perfect naturalism coincides with humanism. It will create the human man by preserving the entire content of his evolution. This is the true end of the quarrel between existence and essence, between objectification and the affirmation of self, between freedom and necessity, between the individual and the species. It resolves the mystery of history and knows that it resolves it. This organization of the human community will not put an end to history, but rather to man's prehistory, his natural history, before he became fully differentiated from the animals. It will inaugurate the era of an authentic humanity in which man will control his own destiny and try at last to resolve the specifically human problems, those of happiness, knowledge, love, and death. He will have been freed from the conditions that made these problems insoluble. For example, biological inequality between individuals is an undeniable fact, but it is monstrous to make use of this fact or accentuate it so as to profit from it. In a human society, such problems will be posed and investigated with a view to solving them practically. Concrete social equality will not abolish natural inequalities but on the contrary will display them by giving individual talents the opportunity of fulfilling themselves. After which the war must be carried to the biological element in order to bring that under control and in order to discover and conquer the necessities stemming from heredity, geograph geographical or racial inevitability, etc. Hmm. As thus defined, human, humanism has a quantitative aspect. It is based on the development of the forces of production. It also has a qualitative aspect. Every human community has a quality or style. Human communities and styles exist already as nations, cultures, and traditions. Total humanism does not aim to destroy these communities, but on the contrary, to free them from their restrictions, to enrich them so that they tend towards a concrete universality without losing anything of the reality. The total movement has got to be carried on by developing and enveloping the content of the present. For such a humanism, the supreme instance is not society, but the total man. The total man is a free individual in a free community. He is an individuality which has blossomed into the limitless variety of possible individualities. But this is not the inevitable outcome of human prehistory. It cannot be produced by economic fatalism, nor by some mysterious finality of history, nor by a decree of society. The living individuals acting on its behalf may be defeated. Humanity may enter into confusion and chaos. The solution is indicated within the total movement. It gives a direction to our view of the future, to our activities and our consciousness. It does not abolish them. How could economic and social automat automatism be brought to an end automatically? Art has always involved attention, a striving towards a total act. In music, a partial element of our sense awareness, sound, tends to become co-extensive within the content of consciousness, as rhythm, movement, passion, eroticism, or spirituality. The same applies in painting with a visual element, the art of vanished epochs whose social structure no longer has any practical significance for us, remains of irreplaceable value. In the most mystical poetry, we can also find certain premonitions of this total act, which has been called the divine or the superhuman, and has always been projected outside man in the name of cosmic feelings, both ardent and obscure. 
Hitherto, the striving for oneness has nearly always been manifested in alienation. Man was hoping to find unity and reconciliation with himself, peace of mind and salvation, in some external belief. The unity of man with the community was sought for in religious, ritual, or more imperatives, or, sorry, moral imperatives. The unity of man with the universe seemed to have been attained in certain moments of ecstatic communion, in which the consciousness emerged from itself and whose intensity was possible only as the price of a lengthy self-discipline. Such flights did not provide a true solution, the moment of conversion, of communion, or ecstasy. Having passed, the human being came back to his wretchedness more profoundly, more profoundly torn and more desperate than ever. His being was outside the human. Of all these strivings, it is art which has retained the greatest value for us. The idea of the total man extends these strivings, but on to a positive and effectual plane. It contains within it the highest values of the past, especially art as being a productive form of labor freed from the characteristics of alienation, and as being a unity of the product and the producer, of the individual and the social, of natural being and the human being. This supreme ideal provides the becoming with a meaning because it is involved in the becoming itself. The total man is the idea, that idea which idealism reduced one-sidedly to the theoretical activity, and which it thought of as outside life, ready-made in the absolute. Ultimately, the total act would be supremely individualized as well as coextensive with her life force, supremely rational as well as supremely spontaneous. Yet immersed in the rhythms of nature, it would, it would be a unique presence. But the highest, the most profoundly human in total consciousness can still only accentuate the first and most profound of contradictions, that between being and nothingness, or between life and death. No doubt man will never be able finally to conquer death and possess his being without fear of losing it, but man fights against death. The human man is the one who has accepted the challenge. Nor is it only in front of him that he finds the ungraspable power of nothingness, for death has accomplices amongst men. The human man rejects all complicity with death, but pledges himself thereby to the struggle against death's accomplice or accomplices. The perishable individual has in his ego more than himself. He has man, mind, and being. The human man will seek to hand on and perpetuate this being to make it more extensive and more profound, to participate in being to the utmost. In this way, he fights against death in himself. <clears throat> the theoretical man must thus pledge himself to recover, elucidate, and transcend a vast human reality. He must open his abstract, theoretical, and formal ego to the world. The new philosophy depends on a real act and on an exigent an exigency, not on a postulate, an abstract alternative, an arbitrarily chosen value, or a fiction. Its task is to make effective the connections implicit between all the elements and aspects of the content of the human consciousness and being. In this quest, the only criterion is a practical one, to eliminate whatever arrests the movement, whatever separates and dissociates, whatever hinders the transcending towards the total content. The philosophical mind in action which are not content with a merely formal position or wholly theoretical outlook can seek to avoid the hiatus between form and content by grasping immediately a certain concrete content. But if the move to grasp a partial content is restricted to this one element of the real, it necessarily erects it into an absolute it turns it into a fetishized form. For example, we may grasp as a content the psychological reality of the individual, the national community, the spiritual reality of man, the human need for unity and reality. Each of these moments of the real, once isolated and hypostasized, become the, neg the negator of the other moments and then the negator of itself. 
limited and transposed into a form, the content becomes oppressive and destructive of its own reality. Thus, nationalism becomes the enemy of national realities. Liberalism allows liberty to perish. Spiritualism becomes the adversary of the living spirit and individualism that of the concrete individual, while totalitarianism is opposed to the total realization of man. Philosophically, to, per to proceed thus turns a partial truth into an error precisely by positing it in the absolute. It creates a meta-something. Racialism is a meta-biology, the theory of nationalism, a meta-history or meta-sociology. Such a procedure involves all the risks of metaphysics. By rejecting a part of the content, it gives sanction to and aggravates the dispersion of the elements of the real. It ignores the contribution of other spheres and thus appears as a specialized or partisan procedure. It expresses a defense mechanism of the individual or of his group rather than a mind directed towards the solution. For the mind that is truly anxious to resolve these problems, only one way lies open. It must strive to grasp the total content. It is this striving which will define the philosophical life.